Good evening. It is a blessing to be here tonight. Uh, for those of you who are unable to join us here in the auditorium this evening, I, I feel sorry for you. You missed out on, a, on an amazing time of fellowship in song. Uh, it was such an encouragement to hear uh, brothers and sisters just, we weren't shouting, but, uh, you know, loudly exulting, uh, exalting our Father in heaven with, with song. It was, it, was, it was a blessed time. Uh, and I understand there are many of you who couldn't be here uh, for health reasons, for other issues. We, we, we understand that and, and feel for you. Um, but we do miss you, and sorry you missed us uh, and missed that opportunity. It was a blessing. If you would, turn with me to the book of Philemon. I hinted at it last week. We're there. Uh, it took us, if I remember right, 17 Sundays to get through Colossians. The goal was one night for Philemon. Now, if we're here for 17 hours, then I apologize. But we should get through it tonight. But before we do, let's, let's just talk for a moment. Uh, you, you know the word. You've heard the word slavery. That word has a lot of, of baggage. Uh, it has meant a lot of things to a lot of people. Many groups, uh, people groups across the planet have varying appreciation, if, if that's the right word, for that word. Uh, they have, to different extents, a different understanding of its severity. Uh, it's not a pleasant word, especially here in the U.S. That word is very uh, painful. It is a, it is a disappointment. Uh, we hear that word in our nation and it brings up a lot of ill feeling. It brings up a lot of confusion as to how men could think and act and behave in such a way. Uh, we'll, we'll talk for a few minutes on that word slavery, but I want us to have a little different understanding of it from first century uh, Rome. Uh, it, it is slavery, uh, but it is different. It is a different mindset. It had uh, to some extent, a different relationship between slave and master. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that to an extent. But I wanted to kind of get ahead of where we're going in Philemon by talking for just a minute about that word. I don't have the expertise, and we don't have the time uh, to discuss every form slavery has taken over the millennia. Uh, but in the context of our passage tonight, um, I want to give you just a few bits of information concerning slavery in the Roman Empire about 2,000 years ago first century uh, Christianity was confronted by slavery. It, it, it was ingrained in the culture. It was, con slavery itself would be confronted by Christianity. Um, but let me, let me explain to you, it was so widespread at this time that, that some believe that more than a third of the population were slaves. I mean, if you can imagine a third of the population, we, 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 we would have trouble recognizing that. And, and there would be daily interaction. Even if you were the poor but free you would, and didn't have slaves of your own, there'd still be daily interaction. There, there, they were, and I think I even read one who said up to half of the population. So that's, that's a lot. That's, that's very widespread. There's a, there's a large, a vast majority of the population that was bound to another, another human. Um, and it was more than our understanding of free labor. Uh, slaves could hold almost any job. Slaves uh, could have been um, very well-educated, very well-trained, very skillful, uh, in, in the jobs that they did. They could have been teachers, lawyers, doctors, accountants. Uh, they, they were, at times, personal physicians to the wealthy. They would have a, a slave trained in, in all of the, the medicinal arts, and that was their personal physician. Uh, some slaves were, were, were used to train their children. They were the teachers. They were the tutors, the homeschool uh, teachers, if you, if you would like. Uh, so any, any job imaginable, even menial tasks, I mean, it, they didn't hold only the, the, the special tasks. They, they, of course, held the menial jobs as well. Uh, legally speaking, they were considered property. They were not persons. 
there would be a time around AD 20 where, where the Senate in Rome would give them the opportunity for trials uh, by jury to give them some rights, but they were still considered property. Uh, they were bought and sold. They were inherited. They were even exchanged for debt. Uh, they, they could be put up as, as collateral. I mean, if you can imagine, they truly were treated as property. They could be punished for very little. Consistently troublesome slaves would even be sacrificed, uh, crucified. Sorry, wrong word. Crucified. Some were treated very, very well. Some were financially better off than the average free man. Uh, they could, in earning their own wages, could even buy their own freedom if they could, if they could raise an up. A, a good slave was about 500 days worth of wages. That's not cheap. Uh, a, 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 if I can not be disrespectful in saying this, but a high dollar slave could be as much as 50,000 days wages. I mean, these things were valuable. They were commodities to an extent. And again, they were, if you can imagine, um, even some could even be granted their freedom by their masters. So there, there's a different um, understanding. So be careful how you, you just assume when you read the word slave, slavery in scripture, we, we don't want to completely compare it to what we unfortunately had to endure in our nation in its early days. There, there is some difference. I'm not trying to glorify it. I'm just trying to lay it out so you get an understanding of what it was like. Um, hopefully get a clearer picture of it. Um, kind of an aside, if I may, as a point of conversation, you, you may have when talking to a, a, a secular person, an unchristian person about the scriptures, non-believers may ask, why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? Nothing to do really with the, the content of our message, but just a, just a thought. Imagine this, though, because you'll, you'll hear that. People will say, that, well, well, I mean, why wouldn't, why wouldn't Paul just condemn slavery outright? You could, you could come to a couple of different conclusions, but imagine if Paul, Peter, John, writing James, began to condemn slavery. And the slaves reading that, there was an insurrection. There was an uprising of slaves starting a, a war of sorts. The gospel message would have been lost. The gospel message would have been ignored. Or the gospel message would have been seen as instigating this fight. Instead, we'll see as we, as we read through this, Paul never condemns slavery. He never condones slavery. But instead, Paul focuses his attention. It's like he takes the gospel and focuses it right on the heart. And says, all right, now this is what the gospel should do to you. Paul wasn't worried about governmental policy at this point. And again, as maybe a second aside, maybe we've spent too much time concerned with government policy and who, who is the face of that policy instead of working side by side with the people we live next door to and the people across the street that we don't necessarily agree with and sharing the gospel with them. Because when the gospel spreads, the policies will match. We need to, we need to be careful with that. With, and, and what an appropriate time to think of that as we, as we come down to the wire, and we may or may not know Tuesday night who the next president will be. But how much more important is it that we talk about and discuss the gospel rather than policy? That is, that, that's one offering for you it, it, to, maybe, to maybe share with someone, okay, that, that would uh, distract from, it would detract from the gospel message. Um, one author would write, by stressing the spiritual equality of master and slave, the Bible did away with slavery's abuses. And I would add, eventually, slavery itself. Paul, Paul was getting to the root of the problem. Instead of just worried about the problem, Paul went straight for the root. So as we, as we turn to the book of Philemon, as we begin to read, I want us to talk about the story for just a moment. If you remember from our study in Colossians, I, I, we talked for just a few minutes about uh, Philemon and Onesimus. Uh, Paul is in uh, Rome, we believe, in jail. We know he's imprisoned. Uh, he refers to himself as a prisoner. He, he refers to fellow prisoners. Paul is, is in prison for preaching the faith. Um, he is, at, at some point, has met Philemon, the name at the top of the letter here. This is a personal letter to Philemon. And in 
right, uh, in, in reading about Philemon, we understand that Paul played a part in Philemon's coming to faith. Uh, Paul was the one, was the evangelist who spoke the good news that, that led to Philemon's acceptance of Christ. Um, we don't know where. We, we believe maybe in Ephesus. Uh, there is a connection there. We've talked about Ephesus and, and Colossae, the, the similar situations. We've talked about the letters written to both, very similar, the parallels. We, we see a number of people passing between those two cities. Uh, that is one of the, the expectations, is that where, that's where Paul and Philemon have met. We don't have enough details to fully confirm, but if you were to begin reading with me, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our uh, beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, in thy house. We, we, we begin to believe by the, 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 the order of this that Aphia is probably Philemon's wife. We've heard this name Archippus. Remember Archippus? Uh, we talked about in Colossians chapter 4. Say unto Archippus, take heed to the ministry that you've been given that you fulfill it. Paul, Paul called Archippus out in the letter written to the church that we believe he is the pastor of here in Philemon's home, probably Philemon's son, and Paul says, you've been given this responsibility to lead the church, now fulfill it, stick to it, don't give up, fight the good fight, keep running the race, run with endurance, run with patience. And so we believe this is probably the family, Philemon, his wife Aphia, their son Archippus, the pastor of the church. The church is in their home. The church uh, regularly met in homes. There was not a consistent habit of building buildings just for church, uh, at this time, the, again, Christianity, as a, if we can say it as a religion, is very young at this point. Uh, it's still growing. It's expanding like, like crazy, like wildfire. But again, they're, they're, they're meeting in homes. Again, Paul, having led Philemon to faith in Jesus, is now, uh, sometime later, we find Paul in prison for preaching, for delivering the gospel, for being an apostle. And he's in Rome. And he makes the, the acquaintance of Onesimus. Now, has he met Onesimus before? I don't know. When he met Philemon before, maybe Onesimus was, was close at hand. Maybe he was that type of a slave that he would have been close. He would have been traveling with Philemon. We don't know for sure. Maybe, and, and, and because I have more imagination than I ought to at times, I think that Paul had never met Onesimus. And somehow the Lord just happened to bring them together in Rome. And Paul was talking to him and gets to know him. And he's like, oh, I happen to know your former master, Philemon. Let's talk. That's, that's where my imagination goes. But at some point, Paul and uh, Onesimus run into each other. They make acquaintance. And Paul, by the grace of God, has the chance to deliver the gospel. And Onesimus receives it. Onesimus accepts Jesus as Savior and gives his life to God and to his service. Again, we don't have enough detail to put all the pieces together, so it takes a little imagination to, in some research, and we, we know certain facts that we put together and say, okay, well, logically, this could be the conclusion. But imagine this biography that we have laying out before us here, so that we're kind of laying out before ourselves. Um, some believe that they met in prison, that, and, and others believe that, that Onesimus was actually searching for Paul in Rome. But again, who is this Onesimus? Let's remind ourselves. He was a slave to Philemon who stole from, we believe, or defrauded Philemon in some way and then ran two strikes. He's in trouble. Um, put yourself in the positions of these three men now. Uh, Philemon has suffered loss and betrayal. You say, but, but he never should have owned a man in the first place. Let's set that aside for a moment. There was loss. There was betrayal. Following Christ... Onesimus now understands that he is to seek forgiveness and restoration. So you've got Ones uh, Philemon. Forgive me if I get the names mixed up occasionally. I, I'm good at that. Philemon suffered loss and has been betrayed. Onesimus, a new believer, wants to follow Christ, recognizes his need to seek forgiveness and restoration. Roman law says that he must be returned to the master and face his punishment. Roman law also says that because Paul has spent time with him, if Paul doesn't deliver him back, Paul could be held liable for the loss that Philemon is suffering, not having his slave there. Paul is going to be held accountable for this under Roman law. Paul says this is a young believer who needs to be discipled. And I have the chance. We're right here together. 
Paul also understands the need for restoration. Set aside Roman law for a moment, not to ignore it, because Paul would not do that, but Paul is thinking this young man needs to seek forgiveness and restoration for the one he's harmed, for the one he's sinned against. So you've got all these relationships, and you've got this, 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 these conundrums kind of floating around. How are we going to do this? Again, Paul could be legally held accountable for what, he, what we might call aiding and abetting. He could be required even to compensate Philemon for Philemon's loss while Onesimus is in Paul's care. I mean, it's getting kind of sticky, right? So there's the story. What's the outcome? Look with me at verses 4 through 7. Paul, talking to Philemon, writing this personal letter, writes, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you by Christ Jesus. We have here Philemon's testimony. Uh, listen to these things for just again, for just a second again. Paul said, I thank my God mentioning of you always in my prayers because I hear about your love and your faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. How the communication of your faith, the, the expression of your faith, and, and even the word there could be translated the fellowship of your faith. Think about that for a second may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in you in Christ Jesus. So a little difficult maybe at first, but Paul is saying your testimony is known throughout the area. People know your faith. They know your love for them. They know that you have faith in God and you love him, and they know that because you love them. Paul's pointing to Philemon's testimony here and saying, this is, this is what I know of you. This is how, this is the Philemon that I know. And this is also the Philemon I know because of what people are telling me about you. Remember, Epaphras has, has come from Ephesus, Epaphras has come from Ephesus down to Colossae, has seen what's going on, and has now come to, uh, to Rome to tell Paul, this is what's happening. So he's brought information about Philemon. We, we, Paul is talking about these guys. Hey, these are the people that are working. These are the people that are faithful. These are the ministers that are doing the work of the, of the church. And Paul's like, man, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. But we now have Paul's apostolic authority. Think about this for a second. Paul's an apostle. And in our understanding, that's kind of like, okay, that gives him great authority. So read with me verse 8. Uh, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech you, being such as one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I could come to you with apostolic authority, and I could give you commands, but I'm not. As your older brother, I'm coming to you in love, and this is, and I'm going to make a request to you. Paul's saying, I'm not commanding you anything right now. I have the authority. But in love, I'm coming to you. And he saw, says here, Paul the aged. And, and, and different people have said, Paul's not necessarily referring to his age, although he's about 60 at this point. But if you think about 60, and then you put in your mind the uh, First Corinthians, where, where Paul talks about being shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, chased, <laughs> kidnapped, imprisoned. Paul is much older than the 60 that his years are at this point. And Paul is saying, hey, I've laid it all on the line here. And I'm coming to you in love, not demanding, not commanding, but I want you to hear me. Look at verse, we read verse 9, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech you, beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. As a prisoner, I've had the privilege to lead your slave to Christ. I think Paul is saying, hey, I'll take prison any day if it means sharing the gospel and seeing souls rescued. But keep reading. Whom I have sent again, speaking of Onesimus, he said, I'm sending him back to you that you receive him. That is my own bowels or my own heart. Paul says, I want you to receive Onesimus, my heart. That's how much Paul cares about Onesimus at this point. And he's saying, I'm sending my heart back to you. He says in verse 13, I would have retained him with me that in your your place he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. You're not here. You can't be here to minister to me as you have in the past. And so I would hope that that Onesimus could. But without your mind would I do nothing. That that your benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but of willingly. Basically, you, you have no way to come get him at this point. He's here, 
I'm not going to keep him so that you're kind of forced to let him serve me. I'm sending him back because I want him. I want you to make the decisions. I want you to, to have the say. Paul's saying, I'm not trying to control the situation here. I'm not trying to be demanding or commanding. I'm offering him back to you. Go back to verse 11 for a second, though. We've seen Philemon's testimony. We've seen Paul set aside, in a way, his apostolic authority. But look at Onesimus' profitability. I love this verse right here. Verse 11 says, which in, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 11, I was right. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to, to you and to me. Paul's playing games here. A fun game. Faith, you'd like this. You know what Onesimus means? Useful. Paul's saying, I'm going to send useful back to you who was useless, but is now useful again. Don't you love it when people play with, play with words like that? That's what Paul's saying. I'm sending Onesimus, which means useful. I'm sending him back to you who used to be useless, but now is useful again. Look what the gospel does to us. The gospel takes useless and makes it useful. The gospel takes unprofitable and makes it profitable. Paul's saying he was a thorn to you. He was trouble to you. He stole, defrauded, and ran away from you. And he was useless, but now he's coming back useful because he has Christ. He is a follower. Um, so Onesimus' profitability, useful, formerly was useless, but now is useful. Remember the example of John Mark we talked about? Paul said, you, me, we're out. This isn't working. I can't take John Mark with me. Just a few years later, he says, send John Mark because he's profitable. The gospel is effective to take useless things like me and make us profitable, useful. Is it an amazing what the transforming power of the gospel can do to a life? But also look, look with me at uh, verse 15 and 16. We see God's sovereign goodness. Perhaps, Paul says, he therefore departed for a season that you should receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Paul says, he ran away from you. He stole from you and he ran away from you. That's not good. But God in his goodness used that to bring him to me that he might be forgiven by God, that he might be rescued from his guilt and from his sin and from his shame. You remember in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am, in the place, am I not in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph got it. Joseph looked back on life and said, you meant a lot of harm to me. God, that's okay, because God knew it and saw it and used it for our good. Look at the great he, good he did in rescuing so many people from famine. It's okay. Paul would tell the Roman believers in chapter 8, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Talking in Sunday school this morning about the characteristics of God, of the nature of God. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is all-present, and he is all-good. How can we not trust that sovereign God who says, I'm going to work it all out for your good? It's hard to, to be hurt sometimes. But Paul says, Philemon, you got hurt. But look at the good that came from it. Recognize that God is still good. God is still in control. So we've seen Onesimus' profitability. Now here's Paul's request in verse 12. I have sent him again unto you. Again, my own heart. I'm sending back. Receive him. That is, my own heart, Paul says. Verse 17, he says, receive him as myself. So when Onesimus walks in the door with this letter, and you're reading the letter, thinking about what Onesimus has done to you, I want you to look up and see him, and I want you to see me in his place. That's what Paul says. See, I want you to see me. Look past the sin that he's committed. Look past the harm that he's, he's, he's caused and receive him as myself. Verse 18, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Put that on my account. Paul says, I'll take care of it. Paul in prison with very little knows God will provide and says, if you owe, he owes you anything, I'll pay it. What does Roman law say that Paul, Paul, is, Paul is required at this point? Because he's aided and abetted. Paul is, is on the line. Is Paul saying this from a legal perspective? Oh, man, I don't, want your, don't send your lawyers after me. I promise I'll pay for it. No, Paul's looking at the, at the law of grace. 
and saying, I'll take care of it. Put his debt on me. Because that's how much Paul loves Philemon. That's how much Paul loves Onesimus. And Paul is that bridge bringing them back together and says, I'll pay the debt. I've got it. I'll take care of it. Receiving as myself. Put his debt on my account. In verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to you now how you owest me unto me, even your own self besides. And I've read this so many times and thought, that almost sounds like a guilt trip, Paul. Paul, are you really going to, I mean, you're going to really lay a guilt trip on, on, on Philemon? That's always bothered me. But then I got to back to thinking about it. And I've been chewing on it for a while. It takes me, I'm a little dense sometimes. But I think what Paul is, is, is not saying here, you owe it to me but he's reminding him of the debt that Philemon owes in being rescued and forgiven. Philemon, you've been forgiven of so much. How do you not owe the same to Onesimus? I have a brother who has done, I guess in the, 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 the way I say it, he's done a lot of stupid. I know I have too. And one day, there was, the, the contention was tight. We'll just put it that way. And I, he didn't like what I said. And I finally had to tell him, it's not that I'm angry with you. I have been forgiven of too much to not extend that forgiveness to you. So we fought through that conversation and we worked through some things. But I've never forgotten that the Lord said, hey, you've got to forgive him. How can you not? Because it's almost like the Lord said, do I need to show you the list of debts that that I nailed to my cross and covered with the blood? And I think that's what, Paul's not laying a guilt trip, but Paul is saying, remember, I, I delivered to you the gospel and you accepted it and you've been forgiven. You've been rescued. Can you extend the same grace to Onesimus? Because God has forgiven and rescued him. We owe more than our own lives. In verse 21, Paul says, Having confidence in your obedience, I I wrote unto you, knowing that you will also do more than I say. You're going to do more than accept him back. You're going to recognize he's not just coming back to serve you, but he's coming back to serve alongside of you in the ministry. He's coming back to to serve as your brother in Christ, as your fellow prisoner, your fellow servant, your fellow laborer, your fellow soldier. All those terms that Paul has used in Colossians and Philemon, he'll use in other passages as he's talking to his friends and his co-laborers in Christ. Paul said, that's what he's coming back to you. So I know you're going to do more than just accepting back and let, let it go or, or charge me for his, for his debt. You're not going to just, but you're going to receive him back with joy. You're going to receive him back with love because Paul has already played on that. He's already said, Philemon, your, your love and your faith are well known, spread abroad. People recognize that in you. So I have confidence that you're going to receive Onesimus back with joy. And you're going to see him as a brother and as a fellow soldier, as a co-laborer in the gospel mission, in the gospel work. You're going to fully accept Onesimus, joyfully restoring him and providing him opportunities of service. And we know this happens as we, as we look at the outcome again. We, we know this happens because Paul is writing in Colossians and says, I'm sending him back to you, a faithful and beloved brother. He's one of you. And he's on his way back to serve and to minister and I can, I, 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 I fully, 100% believe that Philemon willingly brought Onesimus back. Was he still a slave? I don't know. Did Philemon still own him under Roman law? I tend to think he did. But now this is not so much a slave and master, but it's brothers serving alongside each other in the mission. It's brothers serving alongside each other, going about their day making disciples, teaching them everything that Christ has taught them. Onesimus grew from slave to brother to shepherd. It's believed by many that he actually took over the leadership of the church in Ephesus after Timothy. I mean, can you, can you imagine if, the, if we, there, there's some evidence to that. It's not guaranteed fact, but could you imagine if that's the case? You've got Paul writes two, three to three different men, personal letters that are now hidden or kept for us in Scripture. Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Timothy, he leaves in Ephesus and become, Timothy becomes the pastor there. Could you imagine if now, while Timothy is serving as that pastor, Paul leads a slave to Christ, a runaway slave, 
sends him back to his master who restores him fully, and now he's a brother, and then that runaway slave who's a brother becomes the bishop of the church in Ephesus, the pastor of the church. What can the gospel do if we just let it? If we just step out of the way? There's a bigger picture here. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul said, where there is neither, speaking of the, of the gospel, speaking of how Christ sees us, there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. This is a practical understanding. This is a practical matter here. In, in, in light of this system, this class system that you have, Recognize that the bond and the free, the slave and the not slave, are brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow laborers, fellow servants of Christ. We're all slaves to Christ. We're all servants to Christ. So the bigger picture here is forgive and restore. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. If you're wondering, you recognize some of those bitterness. That, that, that inner just, ugh, because somebody's done you wrong. Wrath, that explosion, anger, clamor, just that nonstop, just ugh, yelling, arguing, fighting, the evil speaking, talking bad about people. Let it all be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And that's what Paul told Philemon, is Christ forgave you, forgive Onesimus. I'm sending him back as, as, as more than a repentant slave. He's coming back as a brother. He's coming back as a fellow laborer. You are forgiven and restored. Do you see in this simple letter that Paul wrote to Philemon that has been uh, authorized by God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, breathed out by God. This is God speaking through Paul. Do you see Jesus saying, you were at odds with the Father. And I've stepped in and I've said to the Father, when you look at him, look at me. I'll pay his debt, whatever it is. I'll put all that I have on the line if you'll rescue that one, if you'll save that one. That one's mine. I've bought him with a price. Paul has bought Onesimus with a price by sharing the gospel and the Holy Spirit has stepped in and taken control and, and, and Onesimus has given his life to Christ. Jesus is the one who can truly step in and do the saving and the rescuing. Paul, just a mouthpiece, setting the example of what Jesus has done for you and for me. Forgive and restore because you are forgiven and restored, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's the example of forgiveness. That's the example of forgiveness. As Christ has forgiven you, God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, you forgive. You see the gospel plan so beautifully illustrated in this historical event. And we look at it and we marvel at it. We see the beauty of it. But now look at this history that we're making right now. We can experience the same gospel effect in the world around us and in the lives of the people around us. We can be the bridge builders. We can be the ones sharing the gospel and bringing broken relationships back together. We can mend those, but so much more importantly, as Paul was father both to to Philemon and both to Onesimus, we can be fathers and mothers spiritually as we tell people about Christ, as we share with them the good news that Jesus lived for you, died for you, He was buried and he rose again. And now he lives to make intercession for you. He pleads on your behalf. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of our praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. And how fitting we sing the very next, the very next song, Love Lifted Even Me. Love Lifted Even Me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Father, to think that you, like the prodigal father in Luke 15, ran to meet us, 
when we turned in repentance to face you. Lord, you did all of the work. We turned to accept whatever, whatever scrap we could, we could get from you. And you poured out on us all of your riches. You poured out on us your grace and your compassion and your mercy. Lord, like Philemon, we are often hurt. Help us, like Philemon, to see your grace extended to us, and may we extend that grace to those who've hurt us, that we might see the work of Scripture doing its job, that we might see souls rescued, that we might see families restored, friendships mended. Lord, we need to be reminded of how good you are, how gracious you are. Father, we also need to go and live and and be reflections of that grace and that mercy. Help us to never forget. we're, we're, We're prone to, prone to forget, prone to wander. Remind us and use us. Lord, like Paul, that we might be looking every moment for an Onesimus to love, to care, and to see restored. We pray asking all this through Jesus' name. Amen.